thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's a real pleasure to welcome back Bonnie McBird for her third one per book appearance at the Poison Pen. We are not, the, the Poison Pen is not a Sherlockian bookstore in the same sense that the Mysterious Bookshop in New York has really, it's always been kind of a passion for the owner and a real specialty for them. Yes, Otto, Otto loves Sherlock Holmes. He he's does. a BSI. And he's a BSI. Yes, he's a Baker Street irregular, <laughs> okay. and they meet in New York every January. I think oh, this year is right, January okay. 15th. I've been, I've been asked Sorry. to go, but unfortunately, I can't because everybody comes here in January because you wouldn't want to be in New York if you had a choice, right? Right. <laughs> we had an author here yesterday who was rejoicing that he was in New York. And in fact, he emailed me on Tuesday to say, I looked at the weather forecast and I just changed my plane ticket. I'm flying out right now. <laughs> Spent an extra night, you know. And I took him out for an alfresco dinner, cool. which he thought was really very cool, right? Yeah, this is the place to be in the winter. In the winter, in right. The winter. So yeah. you actually live in the UK part of the time, Barney. Yeah, right. much of the time now. Much of the time, really? Why is that? Well, I, I started to go to London to research my books, mm -hmm. and I just had a great time, and I was really enjoying the city. Uh, and my husband said, you're spending a lot of time there. I'm going to come over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he came over, and we ended up uh, renting a flat, and now we spend probably three quarters of the time there. Wow. wow. Yeah. Do you have bereavement or something? No, we have a visa that we don't have to do that. We did at first, but now we have a, really? uh, we oh, spent really? some time getting a visa to allow us to stay. Oh, that's really nice. So you can nice. you can truly be a Sherlock in here. Yes. Yeah, here in London. So if you notice, all of a sudden it was a little quiet, but there's a new proliferation of Sherlock Holmes books that is suddenly appearing. You all notice that? Yeah. Um, and isn't it interesting? It's kind of cyclical. You know, there are a lot, and then it dies down, and then yeah. um, maybe I think part of it is that some of the people writing them. We're aging, <laughs> but not me though. No, <laughs> heavens no. No, you're the young crowd, the new crowd. No, but but I I'm, I was trying to think. I mean, thirty years ago, I was trying to think of some of the names that were really familiar um, in the Sherlock canon. You know, that were writing pastiche of all kinds, and, and then they just kind of went away. Yeah. So we were really happy to see you as part of the new guard. Well, thank uh, you. With Art of the Blood. Now, how many years ago was it? Was uh, it? So that was six years ago. Okay. So this is my third book. Each one has taken two years. All right. And, uh, no, I guess it was well, no, four years ago. Yeah, yeah, so Art of the Blood was 2015. Okay. And then um, Unquiet Spirits was 2017. Oh, okay. And then this one is now. Right. <laughs> and there's yeah. now I just found out the, there's two more on the way. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yes, they just contracted me for another mm -hmm. two books. That is very exciting. Well, hear it. So, in the UK, you are published by Collins, and so in this, the, the Collins Crime Club, for those of you who don't know, was um, started, Lord, when, back in the 30s or even earlier, mm -hmm. and um, it was Agatha Christie after she mm -hmm. signed her unfortunate contract for her first books with some other <coughs> publisher, but they got her at Collins. So, for years, they had a um, their their deal was a Christie for Christmas. That was their mm -hmm. that was their whole slogan. Mm -hmm. And recently, with all the interest in golden age crime, they've been back in their vaults reissuing a lot of classics and these funny little hardcovers. But the supply <coughs> side of it is extremely rare. Hard to get here. I think easier to get in the in the UK for these little you can see them over there in the classic section if you look. They're these little hardcovers oh, yeah. um, that are kind of face out over there. Those are some, it's like not right next to the gavel. It is next to the Gabaldons. And anyway, you can go over and look afterward. We put them with the British Library Crime Classics and some other things. Um, so Bonnie is in, a, is in a great tradition with Collins Crime with the Hooded Gunman. Do any of you recognize the, um, the their logo? Um, yeah, it's Collins Crime Club, yeah. They yeah. Have, yeah, they, uh, well. Uh, I'll try to find, well, here. I think it's, is there, it's on here or not. Is it on there? Is, you know how publishers have little oh, yeah. signs yeah, to indicate? Is, yeah. yeah, right, yeah, okay. Is yeah, there is. So the hidden, the, the hidden oh, hooded the gunman is, is there. Um, yeah, he's right here. There he is, right? Yeah. Very popular, yeah. very popular thing. So recently, somebody did an entire collection of all of the books that have the a hooded hangman on it. It's a big reference book, you know, for people who like doing that kind of stuff. So who knows, one day, one day you may figure into that volume if they do part two. Yes. 
That'd be very exciting. Right. So, is the American edition of your books changed at all? Do nope. they they don't Americanize the English as they are wont to do sometimes? No. And in fact, um, my editor is English, and so they're published out of England, and they don't change them at all. Um, and I think oh, no. the reason for that is because they're emulating Conan Doyle. So we're using, you know, of course, the British spelling, uh, but not only the spelling, but also the punctuation is a little different. You know, they quote it's the reverse. The quotes are single and yeah. double, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. But do they? They do. I noticed we had some Australians here last week, and they mm -hmm. were confusing everybody because she kept talking about his Christmas jumper, and you know, <laughs> most oh, of the yeah, audience yeah, was yeah, going, right. "What?" Right. <laughs> um, some kind of horse, <laughs> right? So, so do you actually keep like the boot instead of the oh, trunk yeah. and all well, of I that? Well, I mean, yeah, but there's no cars yet <laughs> because it's 1888 in my well, book. That's very true. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I do be in a handsome. But I do, yes, exactly. Um, but I do, I do uh, use the vocabulary and keep very much to the Victorian uh, mm -hmm. English tradition. So yes, I, I actually am emulating Conan Doyle not only in the storytelling setting, of course, and the characters, but also I'm trying really uh, to emulate his, his voice, and that's very distinctly British. It is indeed. What, what got you interested in writing Sherlockiana as, composed, as opposed to anything else you might have written? I love this character, and I've loved these stories since I was 10, so um, my parents were uh, encouraged me a lot to read as a tiny kid, so I went to the library every week. And uh, we had a huge dictionary on our, in our living room out on a stand. And my mother encouraged me to look up words that I didn't know and to use them shortly after. So one day I wrote a story. This is in fourth grade. And I wrote a story, and it was given to my teacher, who got shocked and, and sent it to the principal, who called my mother in. <laughs> and my mother uh -oh. <laughs> said, what's, what's the matter? <laughs> this, and she said, where did she learn this word? And my mother looked at it and started laughing and said, oh, she'll bring that in tomorrow. So the word was ejaculate. <laughs> and I proved that it didn't mean whatever it was she was worried about. Because I was in fourth grade, I didn't know what the other meaning was. Mm -hmm. But that well, is it did it. actually mean what she was worried about. No, it meant, it meant spit out. You know, yeah. just meant, yeah. I see. Yeah. And it's yeah. used, Conan Doyle uses it several times in the canon. You know, nowadays, of course, we have, you know, word search. And so one of the things I do is I mean I get his his language in my head and the rhythms of his speech and so forth and I you know I work them in there but I uh, I if I'm not sure if a word was extant then I will sometimes search the canon to see if it was used uh, or even if it wasn't I might use it if it, it was in common usage then um, but Conan Doyle and Victorian English has you know what we used to call ten dollar words. Now, the, with that, the inflation, it's probably like $25 words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's a lot of those in there. And, um, and you know, I to me, I grew up reading this stuff, so yeah. it's just in my head. It's more formal, right? It, 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 the, the sentence construction is a bit different. Mm -hmm. It's longer. Um, mm -hmm. But Conan Doyle was not as wordy and as yeah. uh, flowery <laughs> as other writers of mm -hmm. his for, for sure. I, well, actually, Thackeray was earlier. I have never, ever been able to read Thackeray. He just waxes on. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, I'm not good at, at dialect because I read too fast. Oh. So I can watch Dickens, but I'm almost never able to read Dickens oh. because he loves, you know, um, Cockney and other accents and so forth. And they're just like big speed bumps for me. Yeah. So everything I've seen, you know, Miss Haversham, I only know her from the right. Silver Screen. The shows, and, yeah. Right. And the movies and the well, I, I do love Dickens, and, and I also try to read what Conan Doyle read, what he loved. And oh, Dickens really? was one of the ones he really, really loved. Uh, and you can see it. I mean, he's, Conan Doyle's really quite funny, <laughs> and, and Dickens is very funny. And um, it's not exactly the same kind of humor, but, but he, does, uh, he does have a little Dickensian stuff in there. And, um, and he also liked the great adventure writers of the time. He liked he liked Kipling and Stevenson and of course he liked um, uh, Scott so he he was a fan of uh, what we thought of as boys' adventure stories, so, which are wonderful. Yes, I well, loved them when I was a kid. Me too. King Solomon's Mines, yes. you Ricky know, Arms. Yeah. John Buchan. Well, he was yeah. a little bit later, but you know, there's some. Actually, it was really interesting. I was having a nice visit with Clive Coaster while sliding a thousand books by him the other day. Um, and he said nobody's really writing adventure stories, his kind of books at this point in time. They are not, they are not thrillers in the ordinary sense. They're really 
you know, they're really adventures. Well, that's why they're called the adventures of Sherlock right. Holmes. They're not the mystery cases of. Right. They're not. They're not. You know. And so they really are adventures. Yeah. And that's one thing I really do with my books. I put our boys in danger. <laughs> I put them out in the field and doing things sure. because if you look at the canon in its entirety. Um, there is quite a bit of action and adventure. Mm -hmm. Just in a single story, there might not be. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the entire thing, there's, I mean, you know, they fall into quicksand and gets a tooth knocked out and these people are stabbed and ears mm -hmm. cut off and strangled and all, I mean, all kinds of mm -hmm. stuff happens to them mm -hmm. and around mm -hmm. them. And so, you know, I, um, I was a movie writer for years and I worked in the studios as a story editor. So um, for me, the, I feel a, a very strong urge to keep them, keep the action moving along, and yet it's not anti Conan Doyle to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I really thought I thought you did that very well in the second book. I enjoyed, you know, the, the whole momentum of the plot, and in this one, you know, you would think that it would be a supernatural thriller from the title and so forth, but it turns out that there are no actual supernatural beings in right. the book. Yes, actually, yeah. Um, he said no ghosts need to fly at one right. point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Sherlock Holmes said that. Them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Unquiet Spirits, the second book has uh, has people who believe in ghosts, and they're in right. a castle that's apparently haunted. But um, Holmes, of course, is not buying that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, and people people travel to France yeah. routinely. You know, I yeah, mean, in the well, well, I mean, real Edwardians yes. went oh. to France. Victoria went to France and winter down, you know, in the Riviera. So, yes, she yeah. did. She loved it. She sort of led the way there. Yes. Um, so they, they go, in the first two books, they, they both, actually, in the first two books, they could do go to France. The first one, they go to Paris, spend a fair amount of time there. I walked those streets and walked the exact uh, places that I had them go. Uh, second book, they go to the south of France, in Montpellier where there was a lot of interesting scientific research and has to do with the vineyards that were blighted at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that caused a kind of a big economic uh, trouble. This book though, I just, I decided to keep this one entirely in London. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> um, but then I thought, well, where can I take people that they haven't seen you know, a million times? You've got the fog, you've got the handsome cabs, you've got all the tropes, they're definitely going to be in there. Uh, but where can I take them that they haven't been? So I took them to a couple weird places. <laughs> One being the foreshore of the Thames. The Thames River is tidal. Mm -hmm. And uh, not too many rivers are that, but the, the tide comes in and out rather quickly. It's like eight, it's eight feet now, it's 10 then. <coughs> and uh, it's quite dangerous, actually. Uh, so it's very muddy down into the, as it drops into the water. Uh, and I went there. I, I just Were you a mud mark? Did you yeah, go I down did, and I try did. to do that? I did go down, but I went with a, a guy <laughs> who's, who like yeah. licenses the mud marks. Oh, I mean, really? it, there's an entity that allows people to do that because otherwise they, they, there's tremendous history down there. I mean, you can find coins from 400 oh, years wow. ago right. and mm -hmm. lots of Victorian stuff. Mm -hmm. There's lots of bits of iron things like big screws and iron rope, which is some of the things we found because we're in the shipbuilding area, which is what I was researching. And um, there's a lot of, it, he said the, in Victorian times, iron was their plastic. It was the, used for everything and then they would just throw it away. Right. Uh, nobody was thinking that this stuff would pile up. <laughs> People are like that, <laughs> we, we don't think this. But anyway, so there's lots of iron bits down there. Uh, and there's one area, there's something place called the, the Isle of Dogs. It's, it's, right. it's not really an island, mm -hmm. but although at that time there was channels cut across the top, so it essentially was not named any longer. But anyway, they, that at the tip end of that was the shipbuilding capital of the entire world in the 1850s, 1860s. By, the 18, by 1890, which is the time of this book, that was all gone. It was like a ghost town, I mean, all, all, although in the water. And uh, so they have quite a quite a dramatic scene up there, uh, where, <laughs> where Holmes, of course, discovers something important, but they get in a bit of trouble. <laughs> I love it. Now you can go out there on the Docklands Light Railroad. Yeah. And I have a very good friend who had a flat on the at the end of the Isle of Dogs, and mm. she looked right across at the Greenwich Naval, the it's Royal Naval College, mm. which was wonderful, and the tunnel that. Um, 
I said Brunel. Yeah, it is in Bard Creek. Uh, yeah, Brunel. it's right. It's right yeah. there. It goes right up under the river and comes right up. Um, yes. Right under her apartment. Oh, her and flats. Right. Well, here's what's interesting. It's it's now. I mean, Greenwich is there, but just to the uh, just to the <laughs> west of yeah, the west of Greenwich. At that time, there were the stockyards, mm -hmm. and it, like that whole place, like stunk to high heaven right. because of all, there was a lot mm -hmm. of industry. There was shipbuilding. There was a lot of welding. Then there was the stockyards where they were, you know, processing meat. It was just like horrible. <laughs> it was like not where you wanted to be. Yeah, the Thames was not a sanitary river for no. a long time. Has the has the um, I'm trying to remember what they call it, the thing that regulates the tide in the Thames. Now, does that affect the? Well, no, it's still quite dangerous. I asked this man what would happen uh, if you fell into the Thames then and now, and yeah. it's actually different then. It was much more polluted than it is now. Right, it would kill you just to fall in and drink the you'd water. You'd probably die. You'd yeah. probably get sick. Um, so it, you're, it was dangerous to get in the water or have a cut or something and get uh, because they just the the sewage just dumped in there. Um, now it's it's much cleaner, but. I said, so what would be your odds if you jumped or fell or were thrown yeah. <laughs> into the Thames now? And he said that your odds would not be that good, yeah. even though it's cleaner. And I said, why? He said, because the, to the it, it's very fast moving. Uh -huh. So yes, even yes, if you're yes. a strong mm -hmm. swimmer, it would sweep right. you along and bash you against now, I was the thinking thing. about oh, yeah. the Thames barrier that was mm -hmm. designed you know, oh, to um, keep the, the mm -hmm. flood from, and I wondered if that affected the tide, or whether the tide, the water just moves back and forth well, through it's it, just unless they close it. Slight, no, it, it's still tidal, but it's slightly less of a, okay. a dip. Yeah, that's all I know actually about it. Um, but, that, but it's a I little bit less. I didn't see it, but um, I wasn't. I'm not totally clear what effect it has on the volume of the yeah. flow. It's designed for disaster. It's not designed for every day. Right, right. You know. Well, I can see that you've had this wonderful time. Don't you wish? I the one thing I would really love to have been able to see, and none of us ever will, was all the rivers that flowed into the Thames before they all got paved over, oh, like the River Fleet. And mm -hmm. Christopher Fowler wrote the most amazing book called The Water Room, in which a woman drowns in a perfectly dry room. And uh, it was all about London's rivers. If you guys haven't read that, it is a fabulous book. Yeah. Um, it's part of his peculiar crime squad and all. But it really made me curious about all the rivers that used to flow you know, drain into the Thames because it's pretty small up up where it starts yeah. in, at Oxford, yeah, and then it so. winds around and it goes yeah. past Windsor, and then it keeps gaining speed and gaining volume as it goes. All right. So, what's the the devil's do? You um, you know, I've already given away the fact that he's not a an actual devil. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, the the devil's do uh, the the premise of the devil's do is. Uh, somebody is killing uh, a sort of as a, a serial uh, murderer uh, operating in London. It's 1890. Somebody's killing uh, these very famous philanthropists, and Holmes mm -hmm. discovers quite early on that they're all members of a kind of secret society called the Luminarians, mm -hmm. uh, which these two sort of foppish MPs have put together to honor, you know, these folks. But they keep uh, being killed in bizarre, really bizarre ways, mm -hmm. and he can't really connect them because the same person can't be angry or vengeful for all of these people because mm -hmm. they're not really connected. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to understand who's who's behind these and why um, and, and stop them before because they, they're proceeding uh, alphabetically mm -hmm. <laughs> through you know, this great swath of um, philanthropists. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then at, at a certain point, uh, a, someone who names themselves Lucifer is explaining that he's exacting revenge on these people who deserve it. Um, and so the subject of laundering dirty money, <laughs> which has come up in recent months in real here in real life, and uh, it comes up. In other words, these are philanthropists, all of whom are, you know, there's something who, shady. Who got their money in unsavory <laughs> and dirty ways. Yeah, so, right. so, so th there's something to be found there. Um, and, you know, I noticed, I know you were, you interviewed uh, Nick Meyer and I, uh, I saw that interview. And, and some people were here. Yeah. Oh, that was I great. Imagine it was so great, like wasn't it? Wasn't it nice to see him back yeah. after yeah. so long? Yeah. yeah. Do you know, he emails me practically every day now. He had the mm. best time. Did he? If he, <laughs> yeah. If he ever writes another book, he's going to be right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Well, that was sweet. Well, I remember you, you asked him a question.
question. He said, like, what made you write this book? And he said, Trump. Trump. And I, yeah. in other words, mm -hmm. he was, and I have to say that, um, that my response to the world situation also <laughs> really affected me on this book. It didn't it didn't make it come from zero because I was contracted to do an, another book. But I I was so upset about things. And and th so I respond a little bit differently uh, and but one of the things um, I found was this this notion of um, how do you how do you justify, you know, certain actions you take as a as a very wealthy person? But the, also, there's a, another. There's a couple of other underlying ideas to this uh, story, and one of them is um, is the notion that it, what would happen if um, everybody becomes so fearful of immigrants, which is the case, which was the case in 1890. Uh, people were f fearful of uh, French and Italian, particularly because uh, there were some anarchists. There was a growing anarchist movement. There were just people bringing bombs in. And they made the same kinds of statements that we're hearing now, which is, they're all terrible, and they're all, anar they're all terrorists, and they're all, the this kind of stuff was exactly going on in 1890 as well. Uh, also, homelessness was rampant. There's four times as many homeless people on the street in 1890 in London per, per capita as there are now. And there's lots now. I mean, you, you, you see them in doorways and so forth now. So homelessness, uh, fear of immigration, this whole lumping together of this, and then in this book there's kind of a rising uh, guy in the police force who decides that the answer to this is to militarize the police. And he sort of has a rather, uh, he, he's very racist about it. And this stuff existed then, so this, this is, I have to admit that I, I'm also having a kind of reaction. And what, what's so wonderful about Sherlock Holmes is that this, this incredibly intelligent and rational person and very strong is fighting the evil in, in all these levels. So he's not a political animal. Sherlock mm -hmm. Holmes is not a political person. So he doesn't a angle through the politics. He leaves that to Mycroft. But, but what he does is he, he cuts through the, the morass of uh, you know, just uh, the evil, the evil that he finds around him. And so the contrast, I think, and I think that's why Sherlock Holmes is enjoying a resurgence right now, is it's a very gray and crazy time. And, and many of us are upset about lots of things that we feel out of control about them. Uh, we don't, and so I think having this kind of hero right now is just, um, it's just so inspiring and so, uh, it's what we need, and that he's a rational thinker based in science. I mean, that is just what we need. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree. I think that the need for somebody who could maybe take charge and solve things is tremendous. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, though, if you also think that the TV series with Benedict Cumberbatch mm -hmm. got a lot of people interested again. Because, you know, I remember when Jeremy Irons, there was a whole Sherlock Holmes thing going on when Jeremy Irons was doing, um, and when I was very young, was Basil Rathbone. Yep, me too. You know, all those Basil the black Rathbone and white. movies. How many of you saw the, all of Basil Rathbone? Yeah. No, I I'm sure I've and seen then, them all. And then I the Granada them. series with Jeremy Brett was, uh, you know, he's, he's yeah. many people's uh, image of right. In fact, my, my actor who posed for these pictures is a kind of a young Brett type. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, uh, he's sort of what I meant. But I, I agree with you. I think, I think Benedict Cumberbatch and the BBC Sherlock, you know, ignited uh, you know an interest. And again, this character is so ri right for now. <laughs> and we so need this guy. Uh, and plus, it's funny and it's enjoyable. It, it's it's both entertainment, but mm -hmm. it's also inspiring at the same time. So tell us a bit about Mycroft because you know he's in his own way he's as forceful and as um, superhero. Right. Know, although yeah. although he's always slightly more questionable because <laughs> yeah. we're not entirely <laughs> sure what he's doing and is it her magic. At that point, still Her Majesty's mm -hmm. government, right? Yes, yes. So this is 1890. So, so Victoria is still in, and um, mm -hmm. Mycroft is portrayed in, in. He's not really all that present in the originals. He's just briefly there, um, but he is he is possibly the British government, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the and, whole British government. Yeah. I always loved it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe he is. I know. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, there's a funny story here. Once um, uh, Mark Gatiss, who played oh, Mycroft yeah. so beautifully mm -hmm. in BBC Sherlock, he was at a convention that I was at, and 
some horrible thing had just happened politically. I can't remember what it was. Something awful. And, and he got up on the stage and he, and he said, I wish I were Minecraft and I could fix this. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole audience mm. just erupted. But anyway, yeah, you do feel like he could fix things. Um, in, in my stories, um, I borrowed a little bit from BBC Sherlock in this one small way. I love the fact that Mycroft and, and Sherlock have a little bit of questionable animosity. Uh, we don't quite know how, mm -hmm. how benign uh, Mycroft looks at his brother. And so this comes actually really comes out in, the, in this third book. Um, so what he's doing is questionable because this guy has, has this, this sort of terrible man has risen through the police force and is doing awful things. And, and Holmes is like, Mycroft, take care of this. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, do your thing, and it, it's not happening. And so he doesn't know why, why, what's, you know, Mycroft is saying, you know, these have to go through channels, you just need to wait. <laughs> and he, but no explanation. So it's not clear, you know, what's happening in the, in the back, back rooms. Um, the room where it happens. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Well, the British government, you know, it's always, it's, always, it's not that transparent. No. So you can imagine Minecraft. Um, yes. Well, that's the problem we're dealing with right here. You know, right. that things are not transparent. So yeah, uh, but maybe becoming so as but, we move along. But well, we hope that the, because he's a Holmes, that he's he's benign and that he's a positive a force. For yes, so, you know, positive change. So what about your version of Watson? You know, how do you see Watson in the, in, in Sherlock's life? Oh, I, I think the friendship is pretty much the linchpin of the whole the whole series, um, and, and and it is definitely that's true in Conan Doyle. I think it's one of the enduring friendships of all literature. So, um, as a writer, I see Watson as a, a man of action, a man of complete honor, mm -hmm. not at all stupid. He's uh, brave, and he's he's the guy you want with you in a dark alley. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he also, you know, brooks no idiots. Uh, and he's not stupid at all, so he's just, it's just relative to Holmes. <laughs> he's not as smart as Holmes. But I think he's a great guy, and he just, he does notice women. He does really like women, and he's, mm -hmm. I think, a very attractive man. Mm -hmm. I, I see him in my head as an attractive man. Mm -hmm. In fact, I see both of them as quite attractive. They, um, they're they young in my series. My, my books take place in 88, 89, and 90, so they're in their mid-30s. Mm -hmm. uh, and I see them as very active, mm -hmm. you know, physically fit and interesting, you know, young men. Uh, and uh, I also, it, it's male oriented, it's, it's a buddy, it's a buddy mm -hmm. uh, series. It's about two guys. Um, and I've been asked a few times, like, well, but you're a woman writing this, like, how do you infuse, like, what, how do you infuse your own personal feminism, which is definitely there, how do you infuse that into here without making it be a point? It, and it shouldn't be a point. I think that would be um, that would be counter to to the stuff. But as a woman, I want to see interesting female characters. So they are studied throughout these books. In fact, uh, I think my favorite one is in this third book, <laughs> and she's a, a 16 year old um, orphan whose name is uh, Hefsiba O'Malley, and she <laughs> she's half Jewish, half Irish uh, orphan uh, in Spitalfields. Her father was a, a champion boxer, mm -hmm. and her mother's a school teacher, but she's orphaned now, and she's just this most street smart uh, person. <laughs> mm -hmm. And she's formidable and, and quite fun. So I put these, these women in, because uh, they're interesting to me. Don't see Holmes having a romance, though. That I would never write, because I don't believe that fits his character. How Watson, on the other hand, notices, <laughs> notices Females quite a lot. He's married though at this right. point. So. Yes, that was look but don't touch. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's like, yes, yeah, so and he's he's a guy. And he's he's you know, but he's a very sympathetic man. I I, mm -hmm. I like inhabiting his mm -hmm. head when I'm writing. I like being with him. Well, I asked that because there's a Holmes book out for Christmas. I can't remember the title of it. it it'll be in the December book of Sherlock Holmes and the Chris something. But in that one, Watson keeps doing bumbling and or doing things that you know mm -hmm. are not that provoke problems you know but he's he's a bumbler um, I don't I don't see what and, as a bumbler. well no it's just a different interpretation but that was one reason um, 
I, yeah, that's it, I think, with the red cover. Oh, the red but cover? I, didn't, oh. I don't like the Watson in that oh. because I think oh. he is a better character. Bruce. Better, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's 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 more fun if he's if he's smart also. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you know, everyone has their own. It's so interesting that it's just like these are real people, you know, and we're all yeah. talking about them, and you know, Holmes lives and the whole bit. But everybody is entitled to his or her own. Yeah, I, I you know, definitely interpretation I, of them. I totally agree with that, and I think there's a lot of creative ones that are quite fun. My my take though is to try to be as close to the originals as I can. That is my, that's what I'm trying to do. Sure. And so, so you know, I've really studied them and I'm trying to understand what it is I love so much why I keep returning to these books mm -hmm. and reading them over and over and over. Uh, and the friendship is one of the reasons. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, we would all like to have a friend like Watson mm -hmm. right? and we'd like to be a friend. So Mrs. Hudson and Mary and whatever, they're all much more subsidiary in some of the books, but in yours, do you try to give them a bigger part? They don't really have a bigger part. They no. definitely are there, though, uh, and I think they're in character. Um, Mary exists uh, in this particular one just to like let him off the hook and so he can go be with Holmes because he's married at this time. Mm -hmm. In 1890, I'm following Les Klinger's chronology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the chronology was not clear in the original mm -hmm. canons, and so many Sherlockian scholars have done zillions of chronologies, but I go by Les Clingers. Okay. <laughs> so they're married at this time in 1890. So, you know, what is, we've got to get them together at 221B though. They've got to be sitting around the fireplace and how does he do that if he's married? Mm -hmm. she, well, that's very that. true. But I've always thought that Mrs. Hudson was an unusually tolerant landlady. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. just, and I thought, I thought Larry King wrote mm -hmm. an interesting book where she wrote about Mrs. Hudson. It's, it's, yeah, you know, yeah, I really good. like that, that because she mm -hmm. is a, uh, I don't want to say an undeveloped character, but she's not, yeah, you she, know, she's, in the originals, yeah. She's yeah, not, like, not she's, a rich character, you know, she's yeah. there to kind of do things, but, right. but she's not, she was good. yeah. So I, I like that, um, you know, when, yes. when Laurie gave her her own book, and then, you know, mm -hmm. you can think of her as off. Where is she in the Riviera of France or something, having an yeah. entirely wonderful life right. at this stage? Yeah. Right. So, um, what do you, you said you're going to do two more books. So, how far forward are you planning to go? Are you going to inch along? Um, you mean in chronologically? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it, 88, 89, and 90 are these three books. And my publisher asked me to do one earlier. So, the next mm -hmm. book I'm doing is called The Three Locks, and it's going to be in 1887. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's not exactly a prequel because I'm placing these in the as if they were in the canon. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's like they've been together since the early 1880s. So it's not it's not an origin of the friendship story or anything like that. But it does play in each case um, in each year of the 1880s. So many interesting things were happening, and I usually start with the mm -hmm. actual news of the day mm -hmm. and right. you know whatever was situationally going on right then. Um, so and they're a bit younger, so. <laughs> so as a as a movie person, you know, are you anticipating any sort of film development for your Sherlock Holmes series? Because there um, seems to be an endless appetite for that as well as for books. Yeah, you know, I would love I would love that to happen. Um, one of the things I did with these books is, you know, he wrote short stories and novellas, but no full length novels. And um, I was movie writer for years, and I, before that, I was a story editor at Universal. Uh, in fact, I was there when Nick's movie was being filmed. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, uh, in the 70s. And, uh, yeah, uh, so, but I didn't work on that script because that was in work before I got there. But I, I worked on every feature film script that was in development while I was at Universal for four years. And um, so my, my training and my instincts are long-form storytelling and mm -hmm. movie telling. So, so uh, Conan Doyle is called cinematic. Uh, before cinema, I mean, in retrospect, obviously, right. mm -hmm. but um, because because he wrote so visually, mm -hmm. so succinctly, mm -hmm. he set the scene, but very quickly, uh, and so much dialogue, much right. more dialogue. Very heavy. He was sort of the Elmore Leonard of his time, yep, you know, yep. and, and because Elmore Leonard's mm -hmm. novels have become movies so frequently because they're almost totally dialogue. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. He so for a Victorian, mass massive more dialogue than normal. 
So, um, so that that already lends itself to to movie making. And then because I write novels, I when I sat down to write the first one, I thought, what is it that I need to do to still make it feel exactly or as close to canon as I can, but extend to this longer form? And um, that became a structural issue. So uh, Holmes is the smartest guy in the world, so he would figure out um, most cases by page 30. <laughs> you know, that's why they were short stories. So then what would I do to make right. it? So they, they kind of do have a structure of a movie. I use a three-act structure, and it's very much like the way I worked in film. But would you want them to be a movie, or would you want them to be like a six-episode TV for each one? I would love to see these three novels, and hopefully the other two coming along, uh, be a limited series uh, because mm -hmm. I thought the I would too. I mean, I think they're too rich to be yeah. just a movie. Yeah, I think each one is like a two episode, like a three, right. one and mm -hmm. a half. So I thought the BBC Sherlock, by choosing to go to ninety minutes mm -hmm. instead of the sixty minutes, mm -hmm. um, they allowed for a much yeah. richer story mm -hmm. development mm -hmm. and also much richer examination of the friendship and the characters. There was time for that in, mm -hmm. the, in those formats. So I, ideally, I would like to see this as a like a mini series or you know mm -hmm. limited series. Well, increasingly they're doing shorter. You know, it wasn't they originally they were quite long, uh, but now I'm seeing a lot of them that are only like you know four to six episodes, and that's right. a season. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so you know, yeah. there's a lot of experimenting going on. But yes. I do think that books, you know, taking a book and just doing a, a 120 minute movie is right. it's hard. You know. Yeah, it is hard, and and I think you're right. There there is more richness here, particularly in the character development mm -hmm. and I, I would love to see these each of these be uh, two one and a half hours uh, so are you connected well enough to make this happen mm -hmm. well not yet <laughs> I'm working on it you are um, I, di I did actually write a script for the first one uh, Art in the Blood um, so yeah I'm working on it but right. So, was there something you wanted to read a short passage or something? Um, would you like to do that? I, would you like her to do that? Or would you rather ask her questions so you could do both? I just wanted to Speak up, audience. I'm what happy to like? take questions. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? I was asking, uh, you, what do you think about when they make Sherlock a woman? Have you ever watched that the series? The, yes, the I watched Japanese, the, the Japanese, Japanese one. Have you one? seen it? Yeah, yes. I, I, I did. I just I just went through the whole thing, and yeah, it always fascinates it. me when they you know bring these characters mm -hmm. to the screen, and I just thought, and I don't know if I, I liked it. I guess I mean it was okay. You know, I don't know that, you know. This is just personal taste, and yeah. I agree with Barbara that everybody can sort of have their Sherlock right. where they want him or or her, or her. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and the same with Watson. So people who love Elementary and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a personal take, but it's just my personal preference, and it's not really you know it's yeah. not a dictum. It's just mm -hmm. I like the originals, yeah. so I really like okay. sticking as close to them as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love BBC Sherlock because I thought they were very true, especially in the first three seasons, to the originals. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and my totally characters. favorite line was that, you know, remember he was trying to give up smoking? <laughs> yeah. And he oh, said, he remember it was a three patch yeah. problem? Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I just love that. I <laughs> that thought was it was so funny. Yeah. They set it up. I mean, you know, you had to, yeah. you couldn't just pop out with it. But yeah. they, yeah. they, yeah. And I really thought that was, was just sad. like the Steve. peak moment there for me. I, I, loved, I loved that show too. Yeah. Well, they, they, the people writing it loved the originals. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that was very clear. Was very yeah, clear. Yeah. So very it was no homage and it wasn't. Yeah. 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 The cell phone instead of the pocket watch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the scratches so and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't even talked about Moriarty. We talked about Minecraft, mm -hmm. but you know they had an interesting take on Moriarty. I, I think so. in the BBC one, didn't you? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, they really did. Mm -hmm. And what a great actor! He is. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. 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 If Holmes is kind of a superhero, <laughs> then Moriarty's a super villain. Well, you yeah. need a super right. villain, exactly. Yeah. Well, you do. To have any kind of a thriller, you have to have you know the yeah. antagonist, yeah. otherwise yeah. the whole thing Worthy. falls flat. Right. Um, and a lot of the time, repeat villains. Are really boring, mm -hmm. you know. But yes. somehow or other, we're already no matter you know how often you run into him, he's still electrifying. Yeah, he is. Crazy. Well, I mean, he's 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 at the top of a big chain, yeah. And so there's yeah. many paths yeah. to that's him, true. and mm -hmm. and that keeps him interesting. And also because he's so untouchable, mm -hmm. you know that that's yeah. an enticing thing. I have not thrown Moriarty into my books mm -hmm. yet, no. um, yeah. mm -hmm. but I do have some pretty serious villains. <laughs> Dire. Why have you not thrown Moriarty in? Did he not appear at the early stages? Yeah, yeah, he didn't appear where they are right now. Mm -hmm. 
and um, then throwing him in, I have to blend in with when he's first mentioned in canon. Because one of the things I set out for myself is not to contradict anything that's in canon. Mm -hmm. So um, I have to be very careful that when Watson first hears of him, you know what I mean? So he can't have appeared earlier, and then Watson mm -hmm. in the canon says, who's the, you know, I've never heard of this guy. So, you know, it has to be that. So it hasn't really fit into my chronology to try to... I have a question, which all of you Sherlockians can probably answer, but I don't know the answer. When did it become a canon? I mean, it sounds ecclesiastical. It does. You know, <laughs> yeah. like we, um, we when did it start system. being called it, the canon? It's a religion. I, that's well, what yeah, no, but I mean, when did it, when yeah, did that yeah. come into play? Is my question. I don't no, no, probably sometime from the BSI because yeah. they're pretty. You Let's know, see if Google knows. <laughs> yeah. I love it when people bring their phones that can answer my questions. Yeah. But um, yeah. I've, you know, the, you, everybody says the canon, and I wonder if you really stop and think about what that means. I think it was in the 30s with Christopher Morley and the BSI. Yeah, it used um, to be a BSI thing. Right, yeah, uh, yeah and of course Christopher Morley. Uh, because then you had, you know, Ronald Knox, who yeah. was a, a clergyman Father writing Knox. about, mm -hmm. about, 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 what did I say, Ronald? Did I say Ronald? No, you did, Father, he's Father Knox. Right, right. right. And uh, I thought I called him Ronald, but I don't know. No. But I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, that they would have, because they were very tongue in cheek, and I'm guessing that that's. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they call them the sacred writings, and right. then they call them the writings on the writings. Yeah, yeah. is that what the yeah, battered yeah. silicon dis dispatch box came into play too? Because you know there was a whole Sherlockian thing called the battered silicon dispatch box. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I, yeah. It, I'm vaguely I think it was Canadian, but I might be wrong. Uh -huh. But I remember, it's I remember back in the '90s when I started the store, we used to get these things. Um, and the publisher, I think, was called like the Battered Silicon right. Dispatch yeah. Box, right? Yeah, in the seventies. Weren't they like publishing. paper bound? Um, I think they were. They were pulp in the seventies. Yeah, yeah. Where it was Battered. But that was the. I mean, the 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 you know pretext was that Watson had left all these papers in a Battered and Silicon is, Dispatch uh, Box, and so they would raid the box, you know, and mm -hmm. so it would be Holmes. It would be Watson speaking to you. Now, oh, whatever now okay. was um, from right. the past, because the papers well, were in right. the in the box. Well, that's called playing the game, and actually, um, mm -hmm. I still I do that with my books. Nick did, yeah. does that with his right. books. I mean, that's what a lot of Sherlockian writers do: is we we have found a new story exactly. you know, from, yep, from some know. weird place, but previously <laughs> yeah. undiscovered yeah. or unpublished. Yeah. Or king for, you know, that yes. device. Yeah, it's, it's a common yeah, advice yeah. for Yeah, well, children. she uses it for Mary Russell, right. but she, yeah. it's Mary's notebooks. But, right, right. You know, right. it's a way of, of, you know, bringing the past to life from the present. Lori, I think, took it to a real height when she wrote a, um, a Russell, but then it was a modern-day San Francisco mystery as well, yeah. wasn't oh, it? Um, the Art of Detection? No. I, no, yes, yes. No, I think it is the art of detection, yeah, right. right? But she was challenged to do that by right. her editor to see if she could manage to write a Sherlock Holmes a and, a, yeah. and a modern novel. And really, to do that, you almost have to have a journal or papers or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's yes. not like you're going to have a wax recording from Thomas Edison that's suddenly going to come to life. For right. one thing, it was yeah. later in the game anyway. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's a pretty time honored device, but it, you know, it's so interesting. I mean, it's been, you know, forever so, that this has gone on. I know. It, over a hundred years, <laughs> and you know, the. Well, I, I am, um, my first book, um, I was researching the, you know, the use of cocaine at that time. This was, took place in 1888. And so I actually drink found. It. Hmm? You drank it. Yeah, well, you, you did it lots of different ways, actually. Yes, you did drink it, you in, inhaled it, you uh, injected it. But it, you could buy it at the pharmacy without a prescription. It was you know, rampant. Uh, but it was also used as an anesthetic for eye surgeons yeah. and so forth. Dora was an ophthalmologist, yes, right. was an ophthalmologist. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so I was, I was actually in the Wellcome Library, which is the Wellcome Pharmaceutical Company. Anyway, so they have a medical library, and I use this for all my books. And uh, I found a really fun mm -hmm. device in there, a quack medicine device in this, in the model, which is right. in, in this book. It's called an ammonia phone. And what it is, is a, it looks like a, a pipe. It looks almost like a recorder. And um, people decided at that time, or the, some Dr. Moffat, actually, from Glasgow, Dr. Moffat, Carter Moffat, decided that it, 
all the great singers came from Italy, so it must be in the air. So he, <laughs> <laughs> so he, 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 oh please, it was the pure vowel sounds. I mean, anyone who's an opera fan knows that. Right. Italian is the only language where there are no diphthongs. Exactly. So when you sing in Italian, your mouth always right. is fully open because yeah. all the vowels yeah. are pure. Exactly. That's why, you know, why, why German and English are terrible languages. And French. Well, <laughs> well and French yeah. with the vowel, with the nasal, and, and you know, know, but yeah, yeah. And anyway. But anyway, doctor was he? So he, he did, didn't know but it was a quack doctor, and he anyway he invented this thing, and he made a fortune with it. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, it mm -hmm. it took uh, chemicals that were in the Italian air and, and put them into a little powder, and you and then you inhaled that. And so that was supposed to make your voice better. Oh, it was vaping. Yeah. Yeah. The original. Yeah. Luckily, yeah. there was no vitamin E acetate right. or whatever involved, so people didn't die from it. Mm -hmm. Can you believe? You know, there was a guy flying back from Dallas from Bouchercon where the mm -hmm. mystery convention where. Um, uh, Bonnie and I were in the seat in front of us, and he dropped his jewel cartridge, jeweled as in J G U L, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he made the steward like tear the seat apart. I never seen an airplane seat completely taken apart. I mean, they took off all the upholstery, oh they you know God. ripped up the oh, seats. Really? They go for this twenty dollar, and finally this woman across the aisle, you know, I was going seriously, <laughs> and she said to him, you know. It'll kill you. Why do you? Know, why, why do you want it? Um, it really was just fascinating to. Nothing like addiction. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So they, they didn't know cocaine was addictive back then. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they had no clue. Drink Coca Cola. And right. so I found yeah. this it, it, at the Welcome Library. And the first when I was researching the first time, I found this really old uh, little uh, pamphlet, all kind of bound up with ribbon and stuff on the uses of cocaine mm -hmm. from exactly that year. Mm -hmm. So I decided what, that that's where I had found the story kind of folded up in a bunch of, a lot of papers folded up in the back of this pamphlet. Because <laughs> this thing is real. I mean, I have pictures of it and it's, uh, it's, it's. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was an age, you know, there was a lot of pain. If you were in Britain, you suffered from the climate. People had terrible rheumatism and terrible arthritis. And, yeah. you know, you didn't even have aspirin. So it's no yeah. surprise no, that um, gin and cocaine um, <laughs> and mixed together, um, you know, yeah. right. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's the same pain relief thing we see going on with the opioid crisis, except they didn't realize how addictive it was. Right, right. So we can see. I think maybe this would be a good moment to wave goodbye to our Facebook audience and thank you for joining us before we go off track even further. <laughs>